Okay, moving on, because we do have a long agenda today. 1.02, receive a presentation from Dr. Murad Gabriel of Integral Ecology Research Center, IREC, on wildlife impacts of trespass marijuana grows. Supervisor Morris, would you like to introduce the doctor? Oh, good. Yeah, this is right. yours, isn't it? It is. Oh. Um, <coughs> Welcome, Dr. Gabriel, and thank you for joining us. My apologies. That's right. Um, Dr. Gabriel and his colleagues have been out in public lands on a lot of these trespass grows over the last few years, and the damage uh, they have seen from the illegal marijuana cultivation. Um, most recently, um, we will probably see if he will discuss further the listing of the fisher in um, our mountainous areas that will have severe impacts on some other industries around here. And so I've asked Dr. Gabriel to give the board and the public an update on some of his recent findings out on the public lands. I, I know he's probably encountered our sheriff department on some of those raids and then some efforts on reclamation on some of the infrastructure that's still left out there, still doing damage, and he can update us on some of the groups he's been working on that. So with that, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Gabriel. Welcome. Right. Thank you. Um, I'll sit here for the microphone. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, uh, for and, and the Board of Supervisors for this opportunity to present uh, in the invitation as well. Uh, because, um, as you well know about it, this is a very pressing issue that is uh, not only impacting the county of Trinity, but also impacting uh, pretty much every county in Northern California, as well as multiple counties uh, throughout uh, the state and, and all their citizens. So with that stated, um, I will give an update on what's going on, but the one thing that I would really like to clarify right off the bat is demonstrate that this is a collaborative effort. Um, so it's an interdisciplinary approach, so it's coming out with an out-of-the-box approach with working with federal, state, uh, academia, so various universities as well as non-governmental uh, groups or non-profits. So this is just a fraction of the folks who have been working on this uh, through either decades or for multiple uh, years as well recently. Um, so the next question is, is what does marijuana cultivation look like on public lands? So uh, many of us are familiar with the private land cultivation, so the backyard grows. Uh, but uh, what does it look like on National Forest Service lands, BLM lands, National Park Service lands, as well as tribal lands too? So right there, if you can see, these are small patches. This is what is con what we would consider a small growth. So these are between 500 plants to maybe 1,000 to 1,500 plants. So these are small grows, but these two grows, uh, the one on the right is actually within Trinity County, the one on the left is in Humboldt County. And what I'm focusing here are only grows that we actually cleaned up this year and only for 2014. So this is, we're not diving into old data, this is actually just um, uh, information and the photos that you're seeing were all taken from this year. Uh, but you can clearly see here, there's multiple plants and there's uh, small complexes. So these are what we would consider, and law enforcement considers, a small grow. Now, we have larger grows here, which is the top one is right by, um, high up on top left, and the top right are actually within uh, uh, Trinity County, but they're in actually the Trinity Wilderness. Um, so the top left one, um, and I'll go ahead and show the arrows, those are where the plants are. They look basically like Christmas trees. That was an 80,000 uh, plant grow. Uh, the one below that, uh, on the left-hand side, was about 20,000 plants. The one on the right in the Trinity Wilderness is a 40,000 plant grow, and below that is also in the Trinity Wilderness. So these are Big French Creek, Hobo, Gulch, many of you are familiar with. These are in the wilderness grows. Um, so those top, um, the bottom and top on the right-hand side are both in Trinity County, and that's about uh, 60,000 plants. But these are only two, two sites within a wilderness designated area and 60,000 plants. Um, and this is also just a fraction of the growth. So it just kind of demonstrates the magnitude of what we have on our plate right now. Um, now the next question is, is how, how 
broad is this within the state of California? Is it only Trinity County or Humboldt County? And we've received some data uh, through various law enforcement agencies that just in 2010, 2011, this is public land grows. We have over 1,100 trespass grows. Um, and really liberally, I would state that uh, 40 to 60% of all sites, and we actually are now starting to find out that it's probably less, it's probably between 25 <coughs> to maybe at the most, 40% of all sites are discovered by law enforcement. And the reason for that is not just, for, it's not as a part of them not looking, it's the lack of resources for them to actually go out there, fly, also resources for law enforcement agencies to be uh, patrolling our public lands or nearby adjacent lands where people are punching into public lands to uh, grow on. So it's, it's not a, a, a lack of their efforts, it's just a lack of resources. Um, and again, only a fraction of them are clean, and that's simply because it's, it, it costs a lot of money to clean these sites out. Um, and so when we bring it up to a fishers, as I was mentioned, the fisher has just been deemed uh, as a proposed, excuse me, proposed to be listed as a threatened species under the Federal Endangered Species Act. So just only two years of data, you can clearly see that the trespass grows have a potential impact to uh, of 30 to 35 percent of all the fishers' current range. We're trying to get the data up to 2014, and based off of some of our preliminary models, it may be up to 50 percent of trespass grows are now impacting. So it has also been listed with the Fish and Wildlife Services that one of the major threats to this species um, is the toxicants and the activities associated with trespass marijuana cultivation. So that also takes in place of if fishers are being impacted, naturally other species such as spotted owls, which have, um, as you know, there's a lot of political uh, um, uh, uh, issues with that, but the issue is now with uh, spotted owls and now fishers are potentially being impacted in a negative way because of this. And I know Supervisor Chapman is very familiar with uh, the fishers because she actually worked on them. So there's, there's three different main facets that we've been looking at. We've been looking at water diversions, the forest fragmentations, and the wildlife contamination. Um, just based off of brevity, I'm only going to dive into a couple of these really quickly. But, the, uh, but one thing to point out is at, there has not been one trespass grow that we have visited in the last three years, or close to four years, that would have been permitted by a state or federal agency. Um, and that's because they're cultivating, and they're cutting down trees right in repairing corridors where any legal practice could <coughs> conduct, and they would be fined heavily. Uh, so there's nothing that we've seen that, as uh, in regards to this activity, that has been green or even permittable uh, at all. So public land water diversion rate. So if we go through that, and we, we all are familiar with um, a marijuana plant takes about six to eight gallons a day, uh, and that is based off of the Humboldt County um, um, Cannabis or Marijuana Growers Association. So they came up with six gallons a day. Uh, we're having an estimate of probably up to eight gallons a day for public lands because they're growing on rocky soil. So if we take that and we say from a seed to a, a, a bud, it would be about uh, 150 days for harvesting, and then therefore that's about 900 to 1,200 gallons per plant per season. So now when we look at just on public lands, and bear in mind that this is only a fraction of what's really probably being diverted, because if law enforcement's only detecting you know, 25 to 40 percent, uh, you could see this could be either doubled or tripled in the amount of water being diverted. So 2012 to 2014, you can see it's over uh, close to 1 billion gallons of water being diverted and 600 million, uh, uh, down to as low as 600 million. So just to kind of put that in context is just a public land diversion rate uh, would be equivalent to three weeks to one month of the whole city of San Francisco uh, household use. And that's just for cultivating marijuana, only trespass marijuana grow. We're not even talking about the backyard grows or the pub, uh, the private grows. <coughs> so again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that they've been proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act fishers. Trinity County has lots of fishers. 
And what I mean by that is Trinity and Humboldt County and Del, uh, some of Del Norte and Siskiyou County, these are pretty much the hub and the core of fishers uh, uh, for Northern California. Outside of these counties, Shasta um, and Mendocino, these are the fringes, so there's very little fishers. So what we have here is a core and a population for this species in Northern California. So that's a very important population because if we start to diminish that core, this species may then start to blink out or start to diminish significant enough that again, it goes back to similar to the spot owls, there's economic uh, issues that occur also because of increase of uh, regulations as well. So with that stated, um, a lot of you, us are familiar with uh, the PLOS One paper that came out. This is open access, so you can just Google and say rodenticides, fisher, public land, and it come up, and, and it's a free paper. It's been peer-reviewed, so it's a scientific paper. Um, in just a four-year period, we looked and we found 79% of California fishers were exposed, and four of those died. And all, uh, two of those mortalities were here in Northern California. Now, since the the paper came out. We're looking at only a two-year period. That populate that the population of fishers in California has now jumped to 86 <coughs> percent. Nine new fishers have died for a total of 13 uh, <coughs> fisher deaths. That's a 57 percent increase in cases in just the last two years. So what this is signifying is that it's not getting better. It's actually getting worse for the species. Now, we, now the next question is, a lot of folks have been wondering is, you know, if fishers are being exposed, how about other species, so spotted owls? And we use barred owls as, you know, that controversy as well, barred owls and spotted owls, but there's, barred owls are a proxy, so a surrogate potentially for northern spotted owls. We work with Cal Academy Sciences as well as Green Diamond uh, Resources Company. So this private timberland has been uh, removing barred owls and then we sampled their tissue. And what we found in Green Diamond was 40% of owls were positive. And then we started working with Hoopa Tribe and found out that 62% of their barred owls were positive. And all of them are positive for a second generation rodenticide, which is a highly toxic rodenticide. So what this is now showing is that most likely spotted owls are probably at a higher rate of exposure. And, and anticoagulant rodenticides tend to have a higher impact or lethality uh, for raptors. So now we want, we, now we're starting to wonder if this toxic and exposure is now impacting the population of spotted owls that may be reducing it. Even though how many millions and millions of dollars have been put towards conservation, this literally may be turning back the, time, uh, the clock on all those efforts that we put in place. So the next thing is trying to look at invertebrates. Now, uh, we go out to grow sites, we find tons and tons of chemicals and pesticides out there. We, and we wanted to find out our prey species that so many different animals use are uh, being affected. So we took some invertebrates, and what we found out that all four pools of invertebrates were exposed to rodenticides. So now these are insects that will not die from this chemical because it doesn't target them, but they're now exposed. So anything that eats these invertebrates, grasshoppers or millipedes or snails that we tested, are going to get exposed. So now we're starting at the very bottom of the food chain. And how contaminated are these sites? So the next thing, this is actually um, uh, Mark Higley from the Hoopa Tribe. We went out with uh, um, an agent from the US Forest Service, uh, Agent Frick, as well as uh, a detective with the Trinity County Sheriff's Office, uh, uh, Mike Risk. And what we did is we went out there and they provide this blanket of safety for scientists because we tend to just keep our heads on the ground and look for stuff. Uh, they're out there looking for us, uh, uh, assisting us. But what happens is, we started sampling soil, and what we did was we looked at soil samples, and, um, and we only had two um, samples that we've submitted to date. And one of them came back negative, but the other one came back positive for rodenticide. Um, and we didn't even find this chemical at the site for 2014. The site has been active for multiple years, which means now that chemical has been in the soil for multiple years, and now has the potential to wash down into our riparian corridors and then possibly in, in impact other species or even impact municipality waters. So now we have to think about not just the ecosystem being affected, but also, uh, and humans are part of that ecosystem, but also the human impact as well. So, well, the recent re, uh, re restrictions, so California has some new restrictions, you cannot purchase uh, a lot of these, but unfortunately what we're finding is bromethylene, which is a neurotoxin, it has no antidote, it's also flavorized, 
It's really hard for us to interpret pathology-wise at the lab, um, and we're finding just massive amounts of it. I need to change that. Um, it's actually, at, at this site is in Big French Creek, um, and that site it says 24 pounds of bromethylene, and actually we just found another um, um, eight pounds, so it's 32 pounds now of this material at one site. That's 32 pounds of rodenticide that they just dispersed out there. In Big French Creek? Yes. And so uh, that's only one site though. Mm -hmm. And then that's 32 pounds of that, and then we have another 10 pounds of another rodenticide. So what we have right now at just Big French Creek in one site is 42 pounds. But we actually just, and I just got the video a couple days ago, and at this particular site, we have a video of a fisher walking through the campsite where we removed all this bromethylene. So you can see now it's not, it's the smoking gun issue, but we know it's out there. Um, and then the other issue is local stores are selling large quantities of this now. So now before, because of the restrictions have been taken up, now the stores are capitalizing and now putting all these these new replacements on there. It, it's, it's basically, it's not a lesser uh, uh, product. It's equal, it's just a basically another, um, it's another wolf in another uh, sheep's clothing, basically. Um, and then radio ads, too, are coming out there, where radio ads are now saying, um, come out, Tomcat actually has a, a radio ad that's punching out in Humboldt County and also Western Trinity County, too, um, where they say, come out, uh, purchase Tomcat, uh, it will get rid of your rodent problem. And it's at, on, um, uh, on FM radio stations. So now you're seeing it's being advertised uh, as well. So the next thing uh, towards the end uh, of this talk is what we're going to focus on is removing these threats. So instead of just telling you guys how bad and awful it's going on, we're also trying to come up with a solution is removing this issue. And as you can see on the bottom here, um, all the various collaborators, uh, specifically in Trinity County, we have the Trinity County Conservation Resources District as well as the Watershed Center. These are two um, assets that you have here in the county um, that um, have been very instrumental to assist us with the remediation that we did, as well as other NGOs within Humboldt County. And as you can see, the federal and state agencies here, the Forest Service, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as the National Guard. So what we did was remove these threats, and, and as Supervisor Morris has stated, is that we cleaned up seven sites. Um, the personnel per day was 50. We had about 25 law enforcement officers with the National Guard, as well as 25 science team members and volunteers. Bear in mind that these law enforcement officers, when they're out there, they literally are pulling pipe and carrying probably more weight than any of the volunteers of the science teams out there. Uh, these are big, strong guys, and they're out there pulling this stuff, and they're doing exactly what we're doing. So they're, they're not just actually providing a safety uh, blanket for us while we're out there cleaning up, but they're also such an asset. Um, and that's one thing that the public doesn't see, is these 25 individuals that are coming out there and cleaning up the site hand-in-hand -hand with volunteers. Um, with that is also uh, the total water diversion that we found from the Trinity River was 67.5 million gallons, and that's only from this year for these for these seven sites. I know of an additional 20 sites that we still need to clean up, and they're and they're far larger. So we're talking about probably a, at least just what we need to clean up for this year is over 100 million gallons that were being diverted from the Trinity River. Um, the total amount of fertilizers was close to 8,000 pounds. So you can see this is fertilizer that was already broadcasted. And a lot of it has already been used and it just pulses in. So now you run the risk of these algal blooms that come in and choke out fisheries and wild, uh, wildlife that are essential. Um, and then amount of rodis, rodenticides that we found at these sites was 128 pounds. But uh, we only probably removed about 20 pounds of it because the rest of it was dispersed or already consumed by wildlife species. Um, we found uh, 560 gallons of usable insecticide, and then carbofurin, which is actually banned in the United States, we found 68 ounces of this chemical out there. Um, the garbage removed was close to uh, uh, basically four tons. That's a lot of garbage, and that's only, that's only camp garbage. That's not the weight of the pipe as well, too. And, that, and what we found was irrigation pipe was over 8.5 uh, miles of irrigation pipe was removed from only seven sites. We actually have 
um, uh, a remediation that we're going to be doing on the South Fork Trinity this uh, upcoming uh, season before the end of the year. And what we're finding in just this one complex is probably close to about, it's going to be one site, essentially about three miles of pipe. Um, and these, these individuals have been growing out there uh, on forest service land for close to probably about four years and, and, and probably diverting millions of gallons of water from the South Fork Trinity. This is what it looks like. This is what these efforts look like. Everybody, military, law enforcement, uh, uh, volunteers, uh, or uh, and NGO personnel out there at these sites, hand in hand, chain garbaging out to helicopter drop off sites. The National Guard donated uh, their time and effort uh, using their Black Hawk helicopter or Pave Hawk, and they pulled out all of that trash. Um, and you can see those are what the bins look like. We had a bin at Big Bar, and we had a bin up at Brush Mountain in Humboldt County, and that's how full these bins are. And that's and if you look up there, that's a military individual and one of the individuals here from Humboldt County, one of the nonprofits, um, assisting, <coughs> tying down all of the pipe and all that garbage, and that's only from one site. So that's the that's the level of garbage from a site. Now, why would we want to involve the local community in these cleanup efforts? Is that you have trained local workforce to assist in cleanups. They, they, they are very they're trained. Uh, they're very proficient in restoration and rehabilitation, and also uh, some of them are trained in toxic and removal. And also the cleanup happens between September to February. This is also a downtime uh, for a lot of folks for work. So it's an opportunity to get these folks back out there in the workforce, and we have lots of sites to do. We need law enforcement to help us and assist us for our safety, but if we have some level of support, then we see that this is an easy potential to get local workforces going out there and, and, and stomping our woods to go ahead and remove these threats from wildlife and so for recreationists or people who want to use our public lands. And it also builds community awareness of impacts of trespass growth and makes them stewards of their public lands. So what when, when I mean, mean about this is that it's surprising that when you bring two people out to a grow that have never been to Trespass Grow, the, the word of dissemination spreads so fast and then you hear the community talk about, we're not, that's not permittable. We're, we're, we're not accepting what's going on in our public lands because what happens out there, these are our public lands and they're, they're basically been put aside for our future generations. So what we're trying to do is remove that threat, but they also spread that word out there. And also, again, as I mentioned, job training and work opportunities for local rural populations. And it's actually a fraction of the cost. We're finding out we're about, uh, when we do these re remediations, if it was just an agency alone um, or just a, a specific organization or contractor alone, we're about 25 to 40 percent uh, of the total cost. So when you get local NGOs and local organizations working and, and, and the military donates their time, it's, we can get it done really quickly and fast and at a fraction of the cost. So that what that means is that we can prolong their workforce to continue out there. And one of the items though is also what um, I've been mentioning is that it can be expensive. So this is where the Board of Supervisors uh, can assist is that um, uh, the cost for basically taking away this trash um, is very expensive. Um, and a lot of our grants are prohibited for certain things like we can't, um, you know, you may pay for trash removal but may not pay for the volunteer time or vice versa. Uh, so we, you know, that's one potential avenue of assistance. Um, but the other thing though too is that it's a great thing when we, when we work with these folks because a lot of these items can be repurposed some irrigation pipe, some of them is contaminated. Um, also, um, propane cans, we find tons of them, and these are filled. And so these are perfectly, uh, can be utilized for, you know, people at uh, groups that are going to barbecue, or also shovels and other gardening equipment that can be repurposed. Um, again, as I mentioned, is that uh, our current supports all through grants. Um, there's no policy. So one of the things that we just submitted by uh, a whole bunch of us as scientists, we said that if the liberalization of the current policy continues, if it continues going down this road, 
Right now, there is nothing in place that states that a certain taxation or a certain fine or the percentage of the fines that go or asset forfeitures would go towards uh, environmental impact. So that's one thing that we proposed is that instead of us looking for grants and basically 10 grows pop up, but we can only clean up two grows, we're always going to lose that. So what we've been at, uh, proposing is that if a percentage of the fines, so if, a, um, if an ordinance were to be uh, uh, placed, then a percentage of the fines would, uh, occurred maybe to remediate or offset the environmental impacts from this activity. So with that, if uh, folks, if there's any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gerard. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, board members, questions for Dr. Gerard. Supervisor Finley. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank I'm you. now depressed. <laughs> <laughs> we are in deep doo doo, obviously. Um, thank you. Or no thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Supervisor Chapman. And it really is just a comment. And as you mentioned, um, in the 70s, I was involved with the Fisher study in Big Bar, Slater Buck, mm -hmm. that group. And I think it's, it's very interesting where we're at today. But I did want to mention, um, I do live in Junction City on the river, and we, we have seen a fisher down across the river from us. And I kept seeing him over there, but it was just kind of a flash. Mm -hmm. And I actually got a good look at him the other evening when I was down there. Yep. They're yeah. still around. Yeah. And they're, it's not all, you know, you know, gloom and doom. But um, No, they, it's alarming. But it's it is. Alarming. It's one of the things that we do worry about because the one issue that we are very concerned about is um, that a lot of wildlife out there uses rodents. And one of the things I also don't, I, I didn't mention in here, but a lot of these groves, there hasn't been one grow site where we haven't found two to three dead deer. So does, they, these folks are out there in the, um, April, uh, March, April, May. So they're poaching the does out there during the time as well as bucks and velvet. And so what we find a lot of the time is uh, we find two or three does per site. And then you know that those fawns are then abandoned and those fawns are going to die. So we, you know, it's just the impact to not just wildlife species that are non-game, but also game species. Um, in fact, we have one of the seven sites that we cleaned up, there was uh, two bears and one of them was uh, probably around 350 pound uh, black bear. And another one was probably a yearling uh, with her uh, that was, uh, was also poached. And, and just in fact, the big French Creek site, um, uh, I pulled, uh, uh, a four by four and a four by five uh, rack from the campsite. So they poached that this year. So that's one in, that's one issue that's going on per site as well. And I do appreciate this because we're really talking about indicator species. Mm -hmm. And but I think getting the public involved and letting them know how this could actually be impacting their municipal water systems, mm -hmm. just as you mentioned, because people have not even been discussing that. So I think that that's a really good, um, that's a lot of good information to go out to the public to get people involved and interested. Because when you start talking about endangered species, they throw out, oh yeah, you're talking about the spotted owl. It's like, no, we're not talking about the spotted owl. That's an indicator species. This is much larger. So talking about what actually impacts them is very important. So thank you very much for your work. And, and I, just to add to that too is that with the water issue is a couple of sites uh, we've done are below, are, are actually above trails. And one of the talks I just gave recently, I mentioned that uh, it, and the trails are heavily used by recreationists to go into the Trinity Wilderness. And uh, I've mentioned that there is no water filter out there currently that you can put below that creek where they're drawing water and all those chemicals are coming in that would actually remove those chemicals that they're using. Some of them are banned chemicals uh, that they were using at the site and that also runs at risk. So it's an unfortunate circumstance to now state that there is a human impact risk when you're actually going out to recreate in the Trinity Wilderness. Yeah, Supervisor uh, Fisher. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I've been following this uh, pretty carefully over the last number of years, along with water issues. Uh, and uh, after sitting on this board for a couple of years now, there is a, a great drag on county resources. Uh, it has a big effect on the general fund of this county. So we get less and less, and they're growing bigger and bigger, and, and it's, it's really gotten out of hand, so. It is, it, it, it is taxing on, we hear from every county yeah. that in regards to resources, mm -hmm. uh, both on the county level and even for local um, ranger districts, yeah. it just, it's, it's, it's daunting for them. That's right. 
And I'd like to open it up for a few minutes. We have for a couple of quick questions from the public. Are there any? Sure. Supervisor, <laughs> supervisor, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sheriff Haney, I just promoted you. So, sorry. Uh, <laughs> that is not a promotion. Excuse me, that is not a promotion. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we're saying Trinity County Sheriff. I want to thank Dr. Gabriel. About two years ago, he came into the presentation, uh, North State Sheriff, and uh, opened our eyes to this issue. Um, uh, it's extremely important for the people out there working on the law enforcement side and eradication side, because we would see these things out there, but but not being trained in it, uh, in the identification and handling of these things uh, again was putting officers at risk so um, I, I think that uh, I, I want to commend them as well as because I think that you know in, in 100 years we may still be discussing the morality of marijuana but the, this is hard and cold scientific data that uh, I don't think whether you're anti-marijuana or pro-marijuana that, that there's much, much dispute here so thank you for your work thank you Thank you. Other public question, comment? Please step to the podium. Time for, well, how? Kay, and then you'll be next. Hi, Kay Graves from Lewiston. I have a question. Is there a place we could go and get uh, some of your raw data from this? Oh, uh, well, we, a lot of it is published already. And so at our website, uh, we have a, a page that's called Toxicants and Wildlife. And that, paper, uh, at that, at that link uh, has all the PDFs yes. that are available. And then one thing that's great about the PLOS paper, the open access paper, is all the data is there and it's open access and you can actually have a comment with the editors as well as the authors if there's any questions regarding that. And that's that. Toxicant and Wildlife? Yeah, if, you, if our website is at iercecology.org. Okay. Um, and there, we have a, a tab that says Publications and under, underneath that tab, um, uh, one of the potential pages you can go to is called Toxicants and Wildlife. And that's where we have uh, peer-reviewed pu publications as well as reports there. Thank you. No worries. Thank you, Kate. My name is Carol Reach. I'm the general manager of the Humboldt Bay Municipal Water District. And we're on your agenda next. And I wasn't planning on speaking on this issue, but I did want to make just a couple of comments. First of all, I really appreciated your presentation. And I think organizations and the collaborations like yours are doing incredible service to get the word out and make it real, make it tangible. And we're seeing the same thing in Humboldt County. I did want to mention that we have a very similar interest and grave concern for the Mad River watershed, as well as all of our regional water resources and assets. And we have partnered with the California Department of Wildlife and are funding an assessment of the Mad River watershed that will be cl close to completed very soon. We had a bit of a briefing in our annual meeting up with the Ruth Lake Community Service District and Supervisor Fenley, CAO Tyler, and Sheriff Haney were present. Um, so at some point I might want to contact you for some collaboration, but we're very much in support of this. It's a, it's a horrible impact on wildlife and habitat resources, and as you've already indicated, municipal water supplies. My board is committing to partner and even provide resources if we can address things on a targeted uh, basis. And as I'm sure you're probably aware of, and if not, you will learn more about this later, the state is developing a regulatory program. It's going to be three-pronged. There's going to be a program where those operators for both development and operation are going to be given a place to go to get a permit, not unlike how other um, industries are regulated. And it's more the Clean Water Act and Port of Cologne provisions for water quality. There's going to be in, in, intended funding, um, you know, um, if it's provided for enhanced enforcement and training and education. And that's an example where we thought as that program gets off the ground, we and others I'm sure would like to come to the table and partner to address this issue, um, you know, kind of more systemically. So thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Okay. No. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Noel O'Neill, uh, Behavioral Health Director, and uh, excellent presentation. And I think we all see the uh, devastating environmental and ecological damage done by this uh, product. I'm also concerned about the uh, behavioral health damage that is done. I'm not so concerned about adults who um, are wise enough to make choices, but I am very concerned about um, the outcome of this product getting into the hands of children and, and adolescents who are not really equipped um, to ingest it. Thank you. Thank you. And that's a great point. Uh, one of the issues that is lacking is a lot of these chemicals are systemic and they stay within uh, the phloem of the plant. And so when you harvest the plant, uh, some of these chemicals may actually be sequestered in the, in the material that individuals. And that's one thing, it, uh, that's not our expertise, but that's something that we've raised in concern when we've tested some of them and they come back positive is uh, what is the potential 
end product of someone either ingesting it or volatizing it. Um, that's actually unknown. Okay, I'm going to bring it back, uh, close public comment now and come back to the board because we do have other presentations and we need to move along. And Dr. Uh, Gabriel, that was fantastic and hit right at home. Very much appreciated, and we look very forward to you coming back and working with all of us. Most thank, definitely. Thank, thank you, you so much. very much. Thank you.